what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. Some 500 years before Christ, Greek philosopher Heraclides of Ephesus said, everything changes and nothing stays the same. Some 2,500 years later, we're still trying to grapple with an ever-changing world. Now, the Future Laboratory makes it their business to understand the profound changes that are rocking our world. And it's all about picking the hits, such as a collaborative economies, whether it's Uber or Airbnb, from the missus, whether that's QR codes and TiVo. So I'm really delighted to have with me Chris Sanderson, which is one half of the duo which Martin Raymond and um, Chris co-founded the Future Laboratory. So thank you for being here. Thanks very much, Naomi. Now, perhaps like no other time in history, we're absolutely in flux. And like I said, mm. you guys are really involved in investigating what's happening to our world. So tell us about it. Is this a really important time in history? Well, I guess... For those of us living right now, it's always the most important time in history. And I think that sense of how history changes is a very interesting kind of debate. You know, what is the most period in history, most important period in history? And it's always going to be now for yes. the people who are living True. and who are alive right now. But in answer to your question, without a doubt, we've seen uh, an exponential pickup the, of the pace and the speed of change. And that's a critical thing, I think, to understand when it comes to how human beings respond to change. Um, and I think that's all about understanding those pivotal moments that define a new era, a new period in, in, in human social history and our own development. Um, and that goes right back. I mean, you know, the, the, the understanding of how man could use fire yes. changed the way men behaved. And yeah. from that point on, men before fire couldn't really respond in the same way that men after fire could. And the Bronze Age, the Iron Age were the same. Um, and you can keep looking at periods in history where you had, you know, epical change that redefined the way civilization was going to, to now, behave. Now, you, I almost liken you to modern day prophets because you have a whole team though. This is a real science. You've got analysts and researchers, you've got uh, you know, neurophysicists and sociologists and you're looking at change. So can you talk us around the mechanics of how you actually analyse what's happening in the world? Yeah, because, I mean, most importantly, it is both a methodology and a science. Yes. So when Martin and I set the business up, there were a couple of really important things that, that, that provoked us into wanting to do what we do. And the first was an understanding um, that we got from the American writer and thinker William Gibson, who, of course, said okay. the future has already happened. It just isn't very well distributed. Yes. And that sense of understanding patterns of distribution went hand in hand with a, with a really seminal work from, again, from the American uh, communications and sociologist expert professor at the University of, of Ohio, Everett M. Rogers, with his work, The Diffusion of Innovations, which he wrote and published in 1962, right. which looked at this idea of uh, the curve, the diffusion of innovation curve, which which proved out really the way in which people respond to change and the number of people who would accept change and the speed at which they would um, respond to change. And that curve, from which we get the expression ahead of the curve, yes. is where you started to look at really key uh, changes in the way that we understand human behaviour. And that work was also responsible for the expression early adopters. Okay. And that's the bit that we look at at the Future Laboratory, which is less than 15% of our population or any given population, the number of people who are actually running towards change. Yes. Rather than either just waiting for it or running away from it. And by focusing our attention on that small group of people who are always ahead of the curve, we're actually doing something that isn't about just assuming Intuit, or guessing yes. or intuiting, although it's a very important part of what we do, we are actually watching and looking and deliberating because we are in turn are observing the actions of a small group of people who are already living in the future. Now those groups of people, the 15%, they're obviously changing in different facets and you work across 15 different industries yep. from retail, hospitality. Do they know that they are ahead of the curve or does it take that groundswell and hindsight for these trends to become evident? Look, I think a lot of them do. When you break that 15% down, you have two 
core groups. The first are those that are called innovators, and they're actually, they represent a tiny percentage of any given population, they're less than 3%. Yes. Uh, and they tend to be the people that are actually out there asking the questions and they're doing things. They're the why people. Um, what's interesting them, about them is they're normally so obsessed with asking questions that they normally that's all they do. So they right. tend to often work in isolation. Um, they tend to take a lot of risks, but they don't necessarily tend to communicate their innovations very good. It takes the group, the cohort that sit behind them, um, our early adopters, uh -huh. to actually translate that newness and that innovation to a wider group of people. So in fact, our early adopters trade on the fact that they're extremely good at telling other people about the newest and the next. And what's an example, I guess, if I'm thinking back to history, like you even looking at Isaac Newton, sort of seeing the world in a certain way and then, you know, people coming along behind him. So are there any great examples in history of early adopters and innovators? Oh, look, I think, I think the, the interesting thing about them when you look at them from a sociological perspective is you don't have to think in those kind of terms. You can absolutely bring it down to your own social group because yeah. within your own social yeah. group, you will know somebody who has always read that book first, Make, t made that download before you, got that app before you, the new phone upgrade before you, seen that movie before you have, has changed their gene style before you have, because everything they, they do is about embracing difference and wanting to be new. And their status, in fact, is derived from their ability to live in the now and live in the new and the next. And we also know those people that are doing that, but they're kind of off on a, on a tangent. So I guess it's the job of the early adopters to validate the direction that these innovators are moving in. Well, I, as I said, I mean, what, what's really interesting about the innovators is that they just want to continually innovate. Yeah. And sometimes their innovations don't go anywhere. And that's part of the process we observe, which is that often innovations occur and then they just fall. They, they're not picked up. There's yes. no what we call a trend cradle because the time isn't actually right for that innovation. Yes. And we've seen that with Google Glass and we've seen that with a myriad of technologies, some of which you've already mentioned, like yeah. QR or, or TiVo. Or, I mean, they're just countless because and of they either come too early yes. or the, the group around them just don't understand how to use them or how to apply them in a way that's meaningful and relevant to their life. Now, you work with some of the world's biggest brands, so Chanel, H&M, Harrods, the list goes on, Condé Nast Media. So what is the core question that these businesses are looking and these brands are looking to answer when they engage you? Oh, look, I mean, that really depends. That's often a very, very personal question. You know, it, that's as broad as what is the nature of, of communication and media comms in the 21st century yeah. to, you know, what will people be wearing next in Sao Paulo? I mean, it's, it's a very, it's to some extent, very bespoke and a very personal question. And yet it's not superficial, I imagine. They're not looking for what's the next colour of the season. These are deeper questions they're looking to question. Well, answer. it depends. If, you're, if your business is fast fashion, then, that's, then getting that colour right True is absolutely vital. I mean, that's where the money is and that's yes. why, why so many of our fast fashion brands continually fail um, because they don't actually ask that question and they don't get it right. Often what they're doing is basing their colour palette on the success of the previous season rather than thinking about what the consumer in the year to come is going to actually want from them. Yes. Now, the, I always find that really interesting. I've been to your forums as well and it's you do say this is sort of the reasons why we're moving into this colourway or into this movement as far as a social you know, political change. Yeah. But time, time will test you and I think you've had an incredible track record of being able to, to basically mm -hmm. analyse. So I guess you guys are very proud of, of being able to pick these things, but again it comes down to science. Well, it is because it, it's, it's about a process. We call it cultural triangulation. So it, it's a process that we've developed over the years to help us to really understand the difference between something that might seem to spike high on a chart but then disappear to something that's actually going to really have relevance in the months and yes. the years to come. So for us, the notion of cultural triangulation is this process of triangulating, which is to ratify using three key points. It's, yes. it's a term that both sociolo sociologists use, but we also use in, in traditional cartography, that idea of, of creating maps and then cartograms, how I read a map, you know, which is that you have to actually be able to position yourself on a map to work out where you're going to move to your fourth coordinate. So for us, it is about intuition, number one. Yes being able to intuit, which is very important, but then it's also about being able to observe and interrogate. Yes. So it's about watching and looking, but then also asking the right questions. Um, and that's not necessarily about a mass survey, it's about asking an expert, somebody who's spent many years in the field or many years working in that particular industry sector, 
So what do you think is going to happen next? You know, yeah. why do you think with an alcohol, for example, we're moving away from clear spirits to dark spirits? Or what are the shifts you're seeing in the term, in, in the way people are consuming cocktails in, in a different way or they're choosing to mix their drinks? Um, all of which questions are, are hugely important if I'm a, a major drinks Absolutely. conglomerate. And yes. that sense of being able to observe those patterns by visiting bars, by visiting the places where people go to drink or, or just finding the numbers from how off-trade sales are, are changing yeah. starts to give you the patterns that, that you can start to watch. And it, it's a bit like being a seismologist where you can start to see all of those yes, needle graph that. movements yeah. that, that show you the tremors that each on their own might not mean very much, but when you take a global perspective on those tremors, those movements, you can build up a picture of potential change and how seismic that change might be in the future. And I love how I've noticed you are really embracing AI and this deep data is really giving mm. you even more power. So how are you applying that in the future laboratory? Well, for, so for us understanding the impact of machine learning, AI, and all that sits around that is, is, is hugely important. So from creating programs that help us to better comb data from the sources that we have is hugely important because that enables us to have a much wider scope of a data field that we ourselves can use. So earlier this year, for example, we produced um, a report that we called the um, Trend of the Trends, which was really how trends are trending. <laughs> so we started to look at how 15 different trend organizations around the world were reporting trends yes. to actually wow. look at what that was telling us about the nature of how trends were changing or or. Or, or moving. So the ability one can have by using da data and data analytics and algorithms to better understand movements and patterns is, is, is massively important at the moment. And now I want to look at how we, this series is about the boardroom, stepping mm. into the boardroom. And as I've mm. mentioned, you walk into some of the world's biggest boardrooms. Yep. Is there a single moment that you can really feel that your business pivoted and you moved on this trajectory? There's something that happened in a boardroom or outside of a boardroom? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things. Um, one is about um, learning the importance of, uh, of your own voice and independence. So there was one particular meeting in the US with uh, a particularly large soft drinks uh, corporation okay. <laughs> uh, where we presented our research on a critical group of consumers that we had been asked to prepare by uh, the business's advertising agency who thought we were just going to rubber stamp the positioning that they had taken without sure. actually reading our research. And when we presented our research in the boardroom, and it became clear that our research actually showed that the positioning of the key consumer group was, was diametrically yeah. opposed to the standpoint that the advertising agency was taking. And the client turned around and said, well, I guess we better go back to the drawing board with the advertising campaign despite the fact that the advertising agency had already committed over $45 million to that campaign, wow. was an interesting gulp moment for a, fa for a fairly young business. And it was about ha understanding your, your own voice yeah. and the in independence and the, the validity of your research and sticking with it. Excellent. In the boardroom. Excellent. So that was And I'm thinking, of, why didn't really that agency cool check your notes before le yeah, <laughs> letting you lose? Yeah, that was a big learning. And then the second, I guess, is I know something has really sunk home when actually the chairman says very little okay. and normally asks me just one quite pertinent question at the end, makes a few notes and normally just says, okay, and then turns the page over. Interesting. Then I know the message has got home it's a and good the sign. result is probably going to be a good one. If they ask too many questions, then they're not really interested Excellent. and they've lost focus. Now you step also into a much bigger arena, forums around the world, mm. carriage works here in Australia. So what is your strategy for being able to have cut through with an audience to actually get rapport with the audience, but also be able to deliver your message? That's a really great question. And because I think it hits on all sorts of different levels. The first, of course, is that your material has got to be pertinent. Sure. You know, it's got to be something that people actually want to hear. So you've got to have a message that's right yes. for your audience, but that is also meaningful. It's got to carry some weight and it's, 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 they've got to be able to, to listen to your message and not just laugh you out of the room. It doesn't mean you can't say things that are controversial or are surprising. In fact, of course, as you know, many people come to our briefings mm -hmm. because they want to be surprised, but yeah. many also come because they want confirmation. They want ratification on something that they've already heard before. But we also firmly believe that you must never underestimate the power of successful communication and good communication. 
So that's also about the ability to hold an audience, to actually translate that message for them and make it something that they can understand by being clear, by being audible, by being engaging, by being entertaining, yes. so by being inspiring and insightful. So it's, it's also about understanding the importance of the, the actual the format, the platform of communication and making it, making it fun, making it engaging, making it exciting. I mean, when we set the business up, again, one of our central premise was just the idea of how do we combat that death by PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, you know, too many graphs, too, just too yeah. many slides or just dreary presentations made by dreary people. Yes. And that for us is equally important. You know, you have and to like, hold the audience in your hand. I agree. Your visuals are incredible. And the other thing I want to pick up on is the nomenclature, the way that you actually bring words together, like yeah. womanomics or mm. pleasure. So yeah. I think those are really important ways to set some new concepts out. So is that something you think a lot about, the linguistics? and? We do. I mean, we're still quite old fashioned in some ways in that many of us have uh, are journalists by trade yes. and by training. So words are our our metier, it's what it's our, there are tools and so the ability to splice words together to create new words is part of the fun of what a bit we naughty. do. <laughs> um, and you know over the years it's also been an interesting process being able to to know with assurance that this is a word that you've created and so you then watch the number of Google uh, yes. hits for it and the number of pages that are associated with that word as it Excellent. grows, as it becomes part of of the language. So that sense of trying to capture the zeitgeist, I think, with a new word is, 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 is part of the fun of what we do. Now, like that reference to fun, I believe when I speak with you and with Martin that there's a, a beautiful, almost um, joyful curiosity about the world around you. So there's some really serious topics that you deal with, but mm. you also have that almost childlike curiosity about where we're going next. So is that how you approach these questions? Uh, without a doubt. I mean, we set the business up with a, a motto, which was also, you know, um, the catch cry of, of the re-enlightenment in the 18th century, which is sapere aude, dare to know. Yeah. And so that sense of never being afraid to ask a question, always being curious, you know, kind of always walking with your eyes open for us is absolutely essential to, to the way that we work. Wonderful. Now, I've got one last question mm. for you. I'm turning the tables on the future laboratory, and I want you to tell me where you think your future is, what's going to be happening in the next 17 years for you and for Martin? Oh, well, look, we're just getting started. I mean, for us, the exciting thing is many of the things that we predicted such a long time ago are finally beginning to happen. Yes. Um, and one of the things that we always wanted to do at the Future Laboratory was never add to the sum total of stuff in the world. Sure. So we're a business that trades intangibles. We trade ideas and concepts. And, you know, at a time when many businesses have moved towards product and started making product collections or product ranges with their name on it and, and that's been something that we've thought about long and hard and we've always said no to. For us, the fact that we're now moving more and more into an environment in which people can understand how they would pay some money for or something for not just information, but an idea, a mood, a feeling, a yeah. state, yeah. becomes very interesting for us because that's absolutely the, 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 the place where we sit and where we want to be. So, you know, be prepared to be buying future laboratory dreams in the future. It sounds amazing. That's an incredible note to end on. Thank you so much for being with me behind the boardroom door, Chris. Thanks for having Thank me. You. Thank you. The boardroom shake. Yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. I'd still buy a future right. laboratory t-shirt though and a coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs>